of you have visited the NIH website at least once. Okay, good, because I need to know how, how much background material you need on what is the NIH anyway. So chances are you all know. You know that we're the biggest, the 800 pound gorilla when it comes to funding biomedical research, but we also, we, I should say, I will do that often because it hasn't been that long since I retired from the NIH. So I should say they, but I'll probably end up saying we a lot. Um, you know that, um, that, that NIH has about $40 billion a year in budget to distribute. 85% of it goes out to fund extramural research. So, um, so that's where a lot of people go to get their support for what they're doing. That's the good news. The bad news is, is that um, in general, and there is always an exception, and we'll talk about a few of them, in general, uh, you cannot really come to the NIH unless you have at least a modicum of preliminary data that shows that your idea is sound and doable. Whereas at the NSF, for example, <coughs> you might need less. So typically the NSF is where you go when you have the scathingly brilliant idea and when you know a little bit about how it works, then the almost scathingly brilliant idea can come to the NIH. So, as you all know, I'm Rosemary Hunziker, and uh, I'm here to, to try to help you a little bit understand a little bit more about how you can approach the NIH and, and, and have better your odds of success, let's say. So, um, these are the things we're going to talk about today. I'm not going to talk 100% about writing an NIH grant. We'll talk a little bit about how you position yourself so you're in the best place to write an NIH grant. Um, and then, um, but we'll spend the bulk of the time talking about the grants. And then, you know, a few words of encouragement for you so that you don't get overwhelmed by this process. It is overwhelming, but if you take your time and you take it step by step, you can get there. So the first message is that how many of you know what an elevator pitch is? I, I'm an interactive type presenter, so if you know. Okay, good, good, good. So an elevator pitch, for those of you who don't know, is essentially a succinct presentation to convince somebody that you have a great idea, that you are the person to do it, and now is the time to fund it. And you, but, but the important thing is, it's, it's essentially your specific aims page of your NIH grant application, but in a, in a more condensed and more user-friendly fashion. And so you basically should have an elevator fit, pitch in your back pocket, your front pocket, your, 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 your jacket pocket, everywhere. And you should use it whenever you can. When you're at a cocktail party, when you're waiting for an airplane and you happen to be sitting next to somebody you strike up a conversation with, at the grocery store for heaven's sakes. Anywhere that you have the opportunity, if somebody's interested in hearing about what you do and what makes you excited, you should be able to tell them, and you should be able to tell them in relatively simple language so that they can be clear about it, because you never know who you're standing next to. I live in the environs of Washington, D.C., and let me tell you, you literally never know who you're sitting next to. And sometimes those people can be very influential and can help you a lot. So um, you need to be, but the critical thing here, for especially for bioengineers is, you cannot dive right into your technology and why it's cool. You have to always link it to an important problem that you want to solve. Because unless somebody is you know, in the lab right next door to you, they're not going to understand or care about your technology. First, they need to know what it's going to do for them. Good idea, especially if you're a junior faculty, find a mentor. If your um, association with your university does not provide one for you or, or recommend you find one, go out and find one on your own. Because the process gets increasingly more complicated and complex, and the nuances become increasingly more important. So it's a good idea to have somebody who's been there before who can help you out. And it's important to realize that the requirements for being a mentor is this, app, this person has to be senior enough to have been through the gauntlet more than once. So they, if they're going to advise you on grant applications, 
Hopefully they've written a successful one before. Um, they have to be available. If you go and ask Bob Langer for some of his time, he, he has you know 40 graduate students and a million other commitments. He's probably not going to be available. Um, and you also need somebody who is going to really give you critical feedback, who's going to tell you if whatever it is you're talking about makes no sense or if your application sucks, but does it in a nice way so that you're not discouraged. It's also important that you understand that, especially as a junior faculty person, the most important thing that you can do for yourself is to collect your core group of performers around you who's going to help you do your work. Nobody works in isolation anymore. There's no such thing as a single investigator grant. I, when In my time at the NIBIB, I might have seen one, and I guarantee you it went on sport. Um, so, the people that you collect around you are going to be critically important because what you may not realize is personnel issues could end up consuming 90% of your time if you have the wrong mix of people in your lab. And that is, that is going to be the kiss of death if you really want to pursue your science in a very vigorous way. Come right in. You haven't really, you haven't really missed much. Just a few introductory remarks which you can catch up on later. And it's really important that you cultivate those people and integrate them into the, into the mix and make them feel welcome and excited about the work that's going on in the lab. It's also important that you go out there and let everybody know who you are. I know that one of the things that was a problem for me early on is I didn't want to tell my story until it was perfect, until I had everything together. And I, I wanted to hide under a rock until I was able to really shine very brightly. Not a good idea, because that might take a long time. But you're a th you're, if you're a careful, inspiring thinker, you have good ideas. And so you should go out there and let other people know what a thoughtful scientist you are, even if you don't have a whole lot of data right now. So that's important to do, especially at scientific meetings. And you can also volunteer early on to become a grant reviewer. The NIH reviews 65,000 uh, proposals a year. That takes a lot of manpower. And people, the same people over and over again are not going to do it. So uh, they're always looking for good new people. And so getting into the system and becoming a reviewer, we'll talk about how a little bit, is a really good way to know how to write a great application because you're right there in the mix with all the people who are figuring out which are the good ones and which are not. Okay. It's also important that you plan for the long haul, especially when you're starting your lab. You need to diversify your funding streams. You can't put all your eggs in one basket because what are you going to, the worst thing in the world that could happen to you is you get all the grants you want and then you're so overwhelmed with all this paperwork that you can't get anything done. It's like chaos. So you have to space them out. You always shoot for the R01, which is the workhorse grant. We'll talk about that a little later. But intermixed, you could sprinkle in some of the smaller flyer type grants. So you stagger these things in such a way that they actually fit with the evolution of your ideas in the lab. Also, you need to realize the NIH is not the only great game in town. It is the 800 pound gorilla, but there are lots of other sources within the federal government that support what you, what you want to do. And finally, realize that it's not enough to just get good funding. That might last through the first round, but if you don't then execute on that funding and then stop to take a minute to write good publications, and then also go out there and advertise what you've done, cooperate with your university so you issue press releases, etc., nobody's going to know about it. And so this balanced approach is something that's really important to consider. Are there any questions so far? Is this a good pace, or do you want me to speed up or slow down? Everything's working so far? Okay, good. As I said, you know, the NIH is an important source of support, but there are other parts of the, the health and human services that can also support your work. And there are other parts of the federal government, especially the Department of Defense, which are very interested in the things that you are interested in. Um, NIST also, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, they don't issue grants. They don't give out grants for this type of research. But they are a really good resource 
especially as you look towards the, the, the more the D side of R&D, the development side. So commercialization standards, um, outreach to help you find commercialization partners, they can be really, really useful to you. So it's a really good idea to sort of um, um, diversify your, your efforts in looking at all of these different resources. But mostly we are here to talk about NIH grants. So there's a lot to talk about, a lot to cover, so we'll just dive right into it. It's first, it's worth pointing out, as I was mentioning a little bit while people were beginning to filter in, that you really need to know your, your target agency and your, the target that you're shooting for in order to correctly position your research and to know when you're at the right space where it's time to apply to that particular agency. So what I'm trying to do here is give you a feel for where are the different places that you can get support for, your, for developing your ideas, where that would come from. And so for example, if you think, and I use the biomate biomaterials as an, as an example pretty, pretty much across the board, so I hope that's okay with you guys. If you have an idea for a new biomaterial, and you think you have some new physical properties that it might be able to demonstrate, coming to the NIH is a terrible idea. Because if you haven't even made this stuff yet, you don't know what it can do. You have no idea what the Young's modulus is. You don't have any idea what the elasticity is. And you know, there's a million questions. So that's a great time to go to the NSF because they love new stuff in science, new toys to play with. Um, and if you can show them that you're a smart person, uh, chances are you might be able to get a small grant to start off with. Then once you build that material and you test its physical properties and maybe a little bit about its biocompatibility, and you say, I think this would be a great scaffold for building a nerve guide. Um, that might be the time to then think about the, the NIH. And so you can see from this top bar, spectrum of support, that you have to figure out where you are on the research and development spectrum to figure out where the best target for you might be in a broad and general sense. As it's shown here, the DOD doesn't care. You know, if you have a good idea that meets a particular need that they've put out a call for, they don't care where you are on the spectrum. If you are a proven commodity, meaning someone who has shown that they're a smart person that publishes, you know, uh, groundbreaking papers, etc. When you look on the probability of success spectrum, um, it's clear that the NIH does not like risk in general. There are a couple of exceptions, but generally speaking, the more preliminary data you have, the better off you will be when going to the NIH with your ideas. The DOD, the riskier the better. They love stuff that everybody thinks is crazy and science fiction. And NSF is a little more risk tolerant, but they don't want to see things that are totally um, without feasibility either. And down there at the bottom, when you look at the team, you know, again, you can see the trend of where all this is going. Another thing that's important to consider about the NIH is people think of it as one entity. It's not. It's 27 different subdivisions or institutes or centers, 24 of which have funding authority. So the 24 pieces of the pie here are meant to basically illustrate for you that there are 24 different units, and they are all a little bit different. First of all, they have different budgets, and that will drive a little bit of what happens because, for example, in this field, our, one of our goals is to get to, to get to the clinic. We want to be able to take whatever it is that we developed into clinical trials. Well, at institutes like the National Cancer Institute at the top of this pie, or maybe the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, down there is that third blue sliver, um, they will have very large budgets. They are in the several billion dollars a year. So they have enough cash to be able to fund a lot of clinical trials. Whereas the institute I used to work at, NIBIB, one of those tiny little slivers near the top, they're a tenth the size of them. And so we don't, we, they, don't fund clinical trials because there just isn't the budget to do that. And also the mission of that institute is not geared in such a way that it, ten, that, it would, that, that would be appropriate because it funds enabling technologies. And so um, you have to sort of take this into consideration when you think about how you're approaching the NIH. 
who am I going to talk to? Which is the institute that is the most likely place where my research would find a happy home? And so this idea, and, the, and another idea to take home from this that's really important is what kind of technologies or what kind of science is being looked at in that particular institute? So the NIH in general has two fundamental types of institutes. One is called categorical, which is either organized by a particular disease or a particular tissue. So the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute that's where you're going to find a lot of cardiac research, vascular research. Uh, the National Institute of Digestis, Digestive Diseases and Diseases of the Kidney, the one that's down here in gray, NIDDK. That one is going to be involved with liver, kidneys, um, uh, the pancreas, things like that. But what's interesting is that in some cases, there's going to be interest in, in more than one institute. So for example, when you talk about diabetes, obviously it's going to be of interest to NIDDK, but it's also of interest to NHLBI, because most of the really serious morbidities that happen in diabetic patients end up being vascular associated. But some of them are also in the eye, so the National Eye Institute might have an interest in that field as well. And so these are the subtleties that are worth thinking about. The other type of institute is called a non-categorical institute, and it's focused on a type of, of technology or science or engineering that's being pursued. So for example, the Genome Institute, it's kind of obvious, you know, that's where they sequence DNA, uh, the human genome, and there's a lot of effort being put there on the tools that we now use to figure out how the genome does drive decision making within, the, within a tissue or organ to affect its, um, its phenotype. And um, the NIBIB, where I used to work, is about enabling technologies. So let's do a little bit of a deeper dive on this idea and talk about this overlap issue. So for example, I, I said, I told you that the NIBIB is about enabling technologies, and that is the mission of the Institute. The NINDS is concerned about neural tissues, so brain, central, and peripheral nervous system, and actually less on peripheral nervous system, more on central. Okay. So you would think that you would have a pretty good distinction about which, which type of thing would belong in which institute. But here's an interesting condition, situation. On the left-hand side of this arrow, you have a novel polymer that you might think might be used for some sort of a scaffolding material to support uh, novel cells that you might put into the brain to look at stroke therapies. And on the far, other far end, on the right hand side, there might be uh, pivotal large animal studies just before uh, being able to go to the FDA for an IND to study an intervention for stroke. So it's pretty clear on which end of the spectrum those <coughs> situations might lie. But in the middle, when you're trying to take this uh, scaffolding material, populate it with cells, and put it in some rats to see what happens, you could live comfortably within either institute. And this is an important distinction here, because depending on your area of specialization, your expertise, the expertise of your, your team, depending on a lot of different issues, you might prefer to be in one side or the other side of this arrow and there are ways that you can write an application that will push you in one direction or another like that. Um, also, a lot of people, and uh, depending on how senior your mentors are and science are, are going to tell you that the NIH does not fund non-hypothesis driven research. That's not true. We have a whole institute that, you know, the one I used to work in, that is specializing in non-hypothesis driven research more tool-driven research. And I love this quote from Freeman Dyson because he really does emphasize why both of those are critically important. Um, and the proof in the pudding here is that there is an entire <coughs> collection of review committees, or what we call study sections, that are focused on engineering aspects. And there are there are programs that begin within the NIH Common Fund, which we'll talk about a little later, which is not an institute-focused fund, but is something that's trans-NIH, 
And many of those programs, if not most of them, have technology development components as their early startup stages because they want to develop the tools to be able to examine the questions, the big questions that they want to ask. So things like the Brain Initiative, lots and lots and lots of technology development that was um, put out as funding announcements in that, in that space. Translation is also an increasing priority at the NIH as evidenced by the fact that the, the youngest NIH uh, section, the National uh, Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, is all about translation. That's what they do. So technology development is really a key and important there as well. So uh, please do not think that the NIH is not interested in what you have to offer if you don't have cell biology, gene expression, things at front and center. It, there is a very vigorous uh, support for these approaches at the NIH these days. And usually technology development goes hand in hand with an emerging field. And the NIH can, will still will be very excited to fund high risk, high reward research. But in order to take that risk, you have to be able to articulate a, a large impact, probably even larger than the incremental science. You have to be able to show that you have a new way of going after it, a novel approach. But not necessarily completely new, because if there's no idea at all that it'll work, they get less and less excited. The reviewers get less and less sanguine. If you go this direction, you're going to have to show that you have deep expertise in the field. Uh, at least somebody on the team has, has a lot of um, credentials in related uh, technologies or related questions so that there would be the opportunity to interpret what's going on in the research. You also need to have a well-articulated, well-developed, compelling research plan because especially in a novel field, there's going to be obstacles, there's going to be problems, and that there has to be a confidence that you have a team that can approach them and still get answers that are meaningful. And as always, if you're not the first person to present this idea to a study section, your odds go up. Usually the first person through the gauntlet crashes and burns. And you could be the second person through, or you could be the first person as a repeat and do better, because they've already seen it and had a chance to think it over a little bit. So how does the NIH actually recruit applications? Everything has to come through an electronic submission through, through a portal that is available to you at grants.gov. And I'm not going to give you a primer on how to approach grants.gov. There's lots of stuff on the web that can show you this. And you're, every one of you, I think, is at an, um, an institution of higher education, right? A university or college, right? Yes, everybody's nodding their head. So the fact is, if you don't know how to do this, go to your Office of Sponsored Research, and for sure they will show you how to get to grants.gov. And you also have to be registered in that system to submit a grant. But one of the things I wanted to emphasize to you is that while a lot of parts of the federal government have very, very specific calls for research that they want to support, the NIH has those calls also. But the bulk of the research that the NIH supports <laughs> is through what they call investigator-initiated um, announcements which means if you have a good idea for something you think is going to work really well, submit to one of these, as they say, parent announcements. And so you will have a grant that will be accepted <coughs> in the main um, and go through a review process. You don't have to wait for a special call or a special announcement like the ones that are described at the bottom here. So before I ask again if, how we're doing, Let's just take a quick look at the diversity of what NIH does support. What kinds of things can you think about? Um, and um, this is a terrible eye chart for you, but it's, what it's mostly meant to do is emphasize that the NIH has a lot of different grants that you can look at and apply for. And they're all a little bit different, um, and you need to know which one you're going after, and we'll talk about some of them. On the left-hand side of this slide, there's a whole cluster of training grants. It's important that you realize that NIH has specific grants meant for training, either pre- or postdoctoral training, um, also career redirection training, otherwise known as K-awards, many of them. 
So if a clinician wants to go into the lab and get some skills on how to do lab re research, if somebody who is a computational biologist has suddenly decided they want to do tissue engineering, you, you can see where this is going. Okay? There is an opportunity for you to take a sort of a pause in your career and using one of this, these support mechanisms, go to an adjacent field and expand your knowledge base in that way. Uh, the second column is where we're going to spend most of our time, so we'll come back to that. But the third column is about complex awards, larger than single investigator, you know, single project awards, but having a larger scope. And the fourth column, and the fourth column on the right is about um, technology transfer, uh, small business development. But the ones in the second column here are the ones where we spend most of our time when it comes to single application um, projects. And the three workhorses that are the mainstay of NIH research are going to be the R01, the R03, and the R21. Is that language foreign to you guys, or have you heard of these grants before? Most of you are nodding yes, so that's good. So, and what is an R01? An R01 is the workhorse NIH grant. This is the one everybody talks about when they say, do you have an NIH grant? This is the one that's used <coughs> largely for when um, um, tenure decisions are made and when you get, you know, check boxes about whether you're doing well or not. How many R01s have you landed? Or how many times have you renewed your R01? Or the discussion is all around this type of grant. It is the com most common grant NIH issues. It's usually three to five years. It's usually around 400K-ish in direct costs. Um, at the bottom of that scale is 250. At the top is 499, unless you get special permission. Most people fall in that vicinity somewhere into the 350K or 450K per year um, place. Uh, it is meant to be a standalone project, but it's meant to address a complex biomedical research problem. So for example, one of the things that you have to realize is you don't necessarily solve the entire problem that you're, you're setting out to, to, to crack with one R01, with a four to five year effort. Because generally speaking, the problem you're addressing is too big to do within that short period of time. So these grants are renewable. There are some people that have been on their R01-40, meaning they've been pursuing the same grant for 40 years. Uh, because the problem that they've been attacking has been a, a big one, like curing cancer. But the, the research evolves over that time, but it is still essentially linked to the same research question that it was at the beginning. These grants have multiple complexities, and they are um, um, considered um, evolving the, the nature of science. It's really important for new investigators to try and target these grants. And so because of that, the NIH goes out of its way to make it as easy as possible for people who have never had an R01 or an R01 level investment from the NIH to be able to get a little bit of a jump start on this process. So if there is a, a what we call a pay line, meaning that above a certain score you get funded and below a certain score you don't at a particular institute, they will, ish, they will give the um, new investigator a bonus of five extra points against that pay line so that you get a little bit of a leg up to get your, your first grant. Um, and down there where it says free three flavors, those have to do with whether or not you are doing human subjects and or clinical research. We'll talk a little bit about those a little bit later. But not everybody is ready for an R01. And so the NIH has two other mechanisms, which are the most common ones that are used, sort of to plug gaps on the way to an R01. And the first of these is an R03. And an R03 is something you should consider basically a small R01, okay? And it is very, very specifically meant to be able to address a very narrow set of issues or problems. And it's short, it's two years, and it's cheap. It's $50,000 in direct costs. And it's very narrowly focused on a very specific thing. If you're writing an R01, for example, and you see that one of your aims has no preliminary data or it's very soft, 
then a, a solution for that might to go out, be to go out and write an RO3 and get support to address just that problem <coughs> for a short period of time to plug that gap. So the kinds of things that are common there are just what I said, plugging gla gaps against a name, or it might be a secondary analysis of existing data to try and get at a new understanding of, of that, what that data might show. Um, and that might enable you to be able to lay a more proper groundwork for writing a more complex grant. Okay? But caution, caution, caution. Not all of the different subsections of that pie chart, not all of the, diff of the ICs support the RO3, the parent RO3 mechanism. So you have to make sure that you really look at that cover page or talk to a program director to be sure that something that might be appropriate, for example, to the NHLBI and no other and no other part of the NIH, you will be out of luck because they do not support the RO3 parent announcement. The grant that is the most troublesome right now at the NIH is the R21 because it was established as a way to deal with the fact that there might be some really great ideas out there that are so novel and, and, and so engaging that there's very little preliminary data against them. They're great ideas, and somebody's got to try them somewhere to see if they're worth pursuing, but, you know, it's a chicken or an egg problem. And so the R21 was created to address exactly that point. Now, the problem is the people who review grants are humans, and so, they, um, there has been a lot of mission creep on, this R on the R21, and so they have evolved into, in many cases, miniature r ones where the expectation for preliminary data was almost as ridiculous as for the R01. And so it was very hard to tell the difference between a two-year R21 and a three-year R01. And so many of the NIH institutes started to run away from the R21 mechanism. And now there's, there's huge controversy over it because um, there are some institutes that are no longer participating in the parent, award, parent R21, but they have written their own. And it says in there, absolutely no preliminary data. If they find any, they won't even review your grant application. Some institutes don't participate in this mechanism at all unless it's a very specific call um, for a very specific target area and it's, they're rare. So it is absolutely critical that you find out whether, before you write an R21, whether the institute that you're best suited for supports that mechanism under the, grant, under the, under the FOA that you want to apply to. Because if they do not, then your application will be returned unreviewed. Yes? So I've, I've written multiple R03s, and uh, one of the problems that I've had with them is that some institutes they review RO1s and RO3s at the same time, and RO3s inherently look weaker than RO1s because you have less money and less time. Any feedback on that issue? So, all I can tell you is that we'll talk a little bit about review later, but I may not stress this point, so I might as well address it now. <coughs> the, the review process is completely maybe not completely, but largely divorced from considerations of the institute or center. When a grant arrives at the NIH, it's, it's turfed out to two places. One decision is it goes to whatever institute is the most appropriate for it, depending on what it's about. You know, if it's about heart failure, it goes to NHLBI usually. You know, if it's about uh, Alzheimer's, it goes to aging, et cetera. A separate decision, totally unrelated to that, concerns the technology that it's about. If it's about the fact that somebody has made a discovery that a new protein is critically important in controlling the deposition of Alzheimer plaques, it's going to go to a study section that deals with the cell biology of things in the brain, etc. But that could be an aging grant. That could be a, a, a um, um, NHLBI grant. It could be a, a ton of other grants. 
because in that study section, the reviewers don't even look at what assi institute or assignment is made to that grant. They just look at the science or engineering that's in there. So um, typically, typically, um, the decision about when you say it goes to an institute that does X, Y, or Z in review is, is a statement that has no meaning. Right. Because, right. because it, it's not, the I institutes should, don't control the I study section. I should say study section. That's, that's fine. Know. But a lot of people do not understand right, that right, difference. Right, so right, I needed right. to make sure we yeah. got it out there. So, so the, but the thing is, almost all, now, all of the standing study sections, they have a formula that they are required to follow because the people who run review at NIH, their number one priority is that every single grant gets a full and fair review. And the definition of that is that they try to make their process as consistent as possible, even though there are over 200 of these review committees. And so part of the way they do that is they structure the review in a very similar fashion, even though they're covering all of science. Part of that structuring is, unless there are very, very few RO3s in the study section, unless the numbers don't quite add up, they, they tend to review them in three batches. The first batch is new investigator R01s, because they want those grants considered separately so that the reviewers are in the mindset to give a break to the new investigators. So in addition to that five-point break, you also get segregated so that they're a little easier on the preliminary data expectations in the review. Then the biggest bulk of them is the established investigator R01s. And then the third tranche is R21s and R03s. They're supposed to be reviewed together. Unless there are just two R03s in there in the pile, and then they could go either way. And there are certain rules that the SROs have to follow about how they set these reviews up. So they are supposed to segregate them. They are supposed to make sure that people, re people realize when they transition to a new mechanism, okay, we're now moving to fill in the blank. As you know, the rules for these grants are la, 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 and they go through them. The problem is that occurs at the review meeting. Uh, the assigned reviewers have already read the grant, and they've already entered their comments. It's awfully hard to change their behavior when they're at the review meeting. So that does happen sometimes, but the good, good, good SROs will We'll try to so that we'll try to forestall that so that maybe the first time through you get screwed in that way, but maybe by the second time, hopefully it's been corrected a little. That's the best I can say. Um, because the RO3 is not used as often, there are vagaries in that one more than others. And that's not really an answer, but it's the best I got. Okay, so when you are sitting down to write a grant. I can't stress this enough. It takes a long time and a lot of energy. It's going to take your best efforts. So you better be prepared to give them. And NIH grant applications are very complex. There's lots of parts to them, OK? But a lot of these things are going to be a little bit cookbook and a little bit that you are going to get, um, you're going to write them once, and then you'll tweak them or you're, they'll be available from your institution and you can tweak them and modify them for yourself. But the core that you're going to have to focus on is going to be the, the seven or 12 pages that constitutes your specific aims, your elevator pitch, and then your research strategy. And that is going to map directly onto the review criteria that the reviewers are told to use. But you also need to realize that your biosketch which has a formula for how it's to be written, and you should definitely follow that. I've seen a lot of people get dinged because they don't have a proper um, um, way of presenting that. They don't do it according to the format. That will go to the investigator criteria, and the description of your resources and facilities will speak to the environment criteria. And I can tell you that a lot of people do not make maximum use of that resource and facilities, especially new investigators because um, there's a lot of ways you can use that space to your advantage so that people don't just gloss over and say, oh yeah, check the box, you know, so. All right, so when I give this talk, I have two slides that I tell people, if you remember nothing else from my talk, 
you should remember this. And this is one of them. So, um, I don't know if this thing takes pictures or not, but if you guys are the ones that like to take pictures, when this slide is finished, that's the one you want to take a picture of. Because this is the key, one of the two keys to writing an NIH grant application. And, the, and so, this is the first, and it is that you need to go into a room with your team and lock the door until you, and don't come out until you finish this page. And this page, it could be six feet long. You know, it could be really big. But this is going to be the blueprint for writing your NIH grant. Okay? And everything on this is going to be something that's going to help guide you in the right way towards writing the appropriate grant application. So, you know, the title is really important because if you get the title right, sometimes in a real hurry, when somebody is in a real rush at the end of the fiscal year, there might be a funding decision and they have five minutes to make that call. And, and it doesn't happen very often, but it occasionally happens. And the more descriptive you can be in the title of your grant, the more likely that you will be one of the people that gets considered. When we talk about key investigators and key personnel, okay, the principal investigator is usually a no-brainer. Uh, there's always somebody who's going to drive the train. But when you talk about key personnel, think about this carefully. Because just because somebody who might be your mentor is a big shot in the field does not mean that that person belongs on your grant. If they are not going to do something on the grant, don't put their name on there just, to, just for show because it'll kill you. The reviewers will hate you for it. You always have to, as we said, have that big medical target that you want to go after. But then you also have to have a goal that is reasonable within the scope of this particular grant. And it's always, always, always a good idea for you to articulate for the group. What happens if this works? Where will we be? We're starting here. We're going to end up over here. What does this look like? And what are we going to do next? once we get to that place. It's always going to be in a continuum. Then you're ready to sit down and write out essentially the modified Gantt chart that's on here. Every NIH proposal typically, typically has three specific aims in it. Okay, sometimes there's two, especially in an R21. Occasionally there's four. And some very complex grants might have five, but that's rare, very rare. Three is what reviewers are used to seeing and you're going to give them the warm and fuzzies the most often if they see what they're used to, okay? And they should be organized according to this formula, which is essentially your first aim should be very low risk. Even in a high risk grant, the first aim should work because if it doesn't, you know, you're out of luck. What are you going to do next? What are you going to do for the rest of your two to four years, okay? So good words there are conf confirm, uh, extend, optimize, that's all good words in specific aim one. So, for example, let's say that you have a new scaffolding material that you have already shown works as a nerve guide. And now you want to say, yeah, it's pretty good biocompatible, doesn't have much of a far body response, this looks like a good material. Let's see if I can make a cardiac patch out of it, okay? But you already know a lot about what this thing does in the body. So a specific aim mud might be really good for, to move from a known technology into a, a, a part um, where there's less known about the biology and what it can do. Once you have that, your second aim is usually where the bulk of the research comes. And that's going to be something where you're going to really uncover the mechanism about what is happening here. You know, I have this observation. How does it work? So that's the part where you're going to peel the onion and use a lot of um, techniques that are going to uncover uh, very specific answers to questions about how the technology or the science works. And goal three, aim three, is usually something where you're taking a little bit more of a flyer and just saying, let's take all this knowledge we have now and push towards a little bit more of the unknown. And so animal studies often show up in aim three or looking at things where you might extend to beyond where this grant, you know, push a little further into where this grant uh, um, is. It's always a good idea to identify the things that are going to be high risk because that's going to be a place where you're going to spend more text explaining what's going on. 
not everybody is the same in the way they learn, so the, that information can also be presented in this way. Your, your, your trunk of your tree ought to be a biomedical need, which leads you to a strong research question. And then your three aims are all constructed in the same way. They're built on preliminary data, they have a background explaining what they're about and why you chose that, and then the approach of exactly how you're going to do it. Again, your aim two is the bulk of the research, and the flyer is aim three. And in this particular example, the preliminary data is in parentheses hanging out to dry there. That is often okay if, if everything else is really solid. It depends on the grant application. But there's, there's one place where you might be able to have a little less preliminary data, but you know that's a little chancy. So always make sure you articulate what's going to happen, where you're going to get to in this. So um, I want to talk a little bit about your specific aims page, and then we'll take a little break and come back and, and talk about the guts of the grant, then what happens when you submit it, and a few closing thoughts. So specific aims. Absolutely the most important page of your application. This is the only page that most of the people who look at your application are going to read. And I will also tell you that I have interviewed a lot of reviewers and they have admitted to me that when they have their pile of grants to read, they will sit down and the first thing they do on your grant application is read your specific aims. And by the time they have finished reading that page, they already know what they think of your grant. Okay, many grant applications these days are you know 75, 100 pages long. By the time you put all the background information and stuff in it, the guts of it, the research strategy, and your aims are going to be either six or, or, or uh, pardon me, seven or 13 pages. Okay, but that one page determines, to a large extent, the fate of your grant. But, and the, pro the point is, when they read enough of these, they can tell whether you on the first page have really summarized everything in a nice, neat, concise, clear package. Okay. So you have to write this for two audiences. The assigned reviewers of your grant are going to be experts in the field. They're pretty much going to know almost as much about this as you do. But the rest of the review committee are probably going to be a little bit more generalists in the field. And so you have to be able to write for both of those audiences. Okay? And it is possible to do this. It sounds really hard, and it is really hard. But again, that's what an elevated speech is all about. You have to entice and excite people, but you also have to convince people that this is not science fiction. All right, so remember I said two slides? This is slide number two. By the time we get to the end of this slide, this is a formula on how you write your specific aims page. You don't have to do it this way, but I guarantee you that if you do, your score will improve. Okay? Because one of the things you will see is that every one of the NIH review criteria that's down the bottom there will be addressed if you do it in this way. Five compelling, concise, plain language paragraphs to explain what you want to do. In the first paragraph, tell me what the important medical problem is. Try to be as quantitative as you can be. Tell me what the incidence is. Tell me how bad it is. Tell me why there's no issue that solves the problem right now. And tell me why your science can help address this. Second paragraph. You're going to have a specific solution to this problem. And it should be innovative. Because if you have the same thing that somebody else just published in science, forget it. They're not going to want to go there. Why should they fund the same work twice, right? Then, the next paragraph, that is your actual specific aims. Each of those three, two to four, aims will have a single sentence in boldface that says what you're going to do. And it should be very specific what you're going to do. And then you amplify that with a couple of sentences after that. Now, the big problem here is a lot of people all they do is take that topic sentence and they rephrase it a little bit and it says exactly the same thing. No, you'll fail. But what you want to do is take those couple of sentences after that and explain a little bit what you're going to do that accomplishes that aim. So for example, if you have a new gene and you want to figure out what it does, okay, rather than state the same thing over and over again, what you then might say is, 
we're going to use RNA-seq, or we're going to use Western blots, or we're going to do whatever it is you're going to do. And you don't have to say a lot. You just have to articulate, these are the techniques we're going to use to solve this problem. And when you do that, the reviewers will say, oh, okay, this is what they want to do. And yes, those are the right tools, or they're not, right? Okay. So what you want to do is constantly add the next layer of information. So the reviewers start, you know, when they see this thing, they're going to think, oh, I wonder how they're going to do that. Oh, the next sentence tells you how they're going to do that. Oh, I wonder what data they think they're going to get out of that. And in general, if you have a sentence that says, we expect to see, whatever, whatever, we expect to take this ge data and generate a heat map, that points to something, okay, then they're going to see a logic flow and pattern in your thinking that's going to say, this is the right way to do it. This is a smart person. They know what they're doing. Okay. Then, after you do that, it's, if, if you can take a sentence or two and outline the expertise on your team, you are going to do yourself a lot of good. Because all you have to say is, this project is led by PI so-and-so who has a bi back background in biomaterials and um, stem cell development, and is supported by you know, so-and-so who is a cardiac specialist or a neuroscientist or, and also by so-and-so who is a clinician with years of experience with the animal model. Where you, you know, that doesn't take more than two or three lines. And it really can be useful because it helps to solidify this message of right place, right time, right people. And finally, take a couple of sentences to say what happens if you're successful, where, and where are you going to go next. Often this is the one that says, you know, this research will be able to establish the, this platform of yada, 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 and we expect to leverage this into writing an R01, or getting together an IND to go to the clinic, or whatever it is. Questions? All right. So next, we're going to go a little bit deeper into the research strategy. Can I ask a question on the sure. specific games section? The other thing I've heard over the years, depending on who I talk to, that you need to have your specific games need to be independent of one another. But the way that you laid yours out, it didn't look like they necessarily needed to be that case. And yeah. I've always struggled to try to write specific games that are independent of one another. So think about why they need to be independent. Everything in this is about making sure that the work can be done. So if if some, if aim one blows up, right. you know, is is it still possible to pursue aims two and three? That level of independence is what they're talking about and what is needed. But it can't be so totally independent that they're different projects, or it would be different grants. So the way to approach that is to say. How do I make sure that I can do one even if the others fail? So, for example, if in the example I tried to use for you, that I have a scaffold that works as a nerve guide and I want to see if it works for making a cardiac patch, maybe for you, A1 blows up because you can't get a good source of cardiomyocytes. Well, then maybe you could try some stem cells and maybe there's other alternatives, okay? But once you create that patch in AIM-2, you can still do all the studies to say whether or not the alternative worked. So as long as you put those alternatives in there in a logical pattern that is somewhat convincing, obviously when you have alternatives, if that was the best way to go, you would have done that instead of what would you propose. But as long as you can create a story that basically gets to the same end point, your aims are not critically dependent on each other. Does that help? Does everybody know what I'm talking about there? Okay. It's a little bit of a case-by-case -case situation, but it, you know, it's an excellent point and an excellent question. Okay, so uh, there's the next section has a little bit of paired slides, and the first one of the pair is sort of about the, the garden variety common wisdom that the NIH shares. and. A lot of this is on the website, so I don't spend a lot of time on it. You can review it on your own. And the second slide of the pair is often a little bit of a deeper dive into something specific about that issue. So the first is about significance. And 
that is a section of the grant that you have to write. It tends to be two, three, maybe four pages long. Most people don't write it in as much depth and detail as they should. And here are the questions that the NIH tells you on the significance are really, really important for you to address. Again, we keep coming back to the fact is first you have to identify an unmet medical need, and then you have to tell everybody why it's important, why is it big, why is it something they need to care about. You also then have to explain what do we know already about this issue. You know, so what is the state of the art? Where do we sit right now? And then where do we want to go? I want to, I have a solution. Why will it matter? Why will it make a difference? These are all things that are on the NIH website to discuss significance, so you can review this slide or some at the NIH site on your own. Um, also important to point out here that graphs and pictures are really good and they're really important, but make sure they're relevant and make sure they say what you want them to say because you have to sacrifice a lot of text to put a picture in there, so it better mean something and it better be important. A lot of people, for example, take their specific aims page and they do a graphic that's, that illustrates, graphically illustrates aims one, two, and three. That is a wonderful idea. That is a great idea. But it better be complex enough that it really illustrates something about aims one, two, and three that they couldn't read by going back to the specific aims page and getting the same information. Because, you know, if you sacrifice real estate in your grant, to repeat something you've already done, and it doesn't give a, a, a different nuance or a little bit of subtlety to it, the reviewers are not going to be impressed. As a matter of fact, they're probably going to be annoyed. So it's also important to realize significance is about context. How many people here who know who Joshua Bell is? A couple. Yeah, great. OK, he's the most famous violinist in the world right now. And that thing he's sawing away on is probably worth more than your lap. You know, it's a Stradivarius. It's like a few million dollars. <laughs> so, um, but the thing is, you know, when he comes to town, people who know him, they really go after those tickets. They're hard to get. But the Washington Post did an experiment with him a few years ago, and put him in the Washington, one of the Washington metro stations at 8:30 in the morning. You know, dressed him up in a baseball cap. Same violin, same repertoire, but he made 32 bucks because nobody knew what they were looking at. And I think there was like one eight-year-old girl or something who said, Mommy, he's really good. And the mother said, yeah, 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 but we got to get to wherever we're going. Okay, so what is the lesson for us when writing a grant application? Um, reviewers are not going to hunt for the value. You have to hit them over the head with it. They probably know already, but they want to know that you know and can tell them, because that's part of the job in writing the grant, right? So um, you also need to stand out in your ideas, not the way you present yourself. You know, don't, don't try to be memorable by being weird, because it, it might work in some places, but it's not going to work in writing a grant application, because these reviewers are busy and they just want to get to it. You need to understand who your audience is, and we may have time to talk about this a little more. Who is the review committee, and what are they going to do? Okay. Um, speak to the knowledge base of the study section. Don't make it too foreign to them. Okay, so innovation. Again, we have um, some recommendations from the NIH website. And again, these slides will be available to you, and there's also some stuff where this is distilled for you on the NIH website, so I won't go into it in detail. But you do want to say that innovation is a very, very difficult thing to define in NIH grant applications. Not because it's difficult to define, but because it's difficult for the reviewers to articulate what they want. So I have seen the exact same statement in a summary, in a review, treated differently. This, in a, this application is not innovative because all they did was take this well-known scaffolding material that's been proven in their guides and repurpose it for a cardiac application. Second reviewer. This application is wonderfully innovative because they have taken this well-known thing and put it to a new application. The exact same thing, and there's a 180-degree difference in how the reviewers interpret it. 
So the bottom line is the innovation criteria, we try, NIH tries to keep hammering on it, but it's really hard to do. And ultimately, a grant rarely goes down on this criteria. It's a nail in the coffin kind of thing. Okay? So it's important that you articulate innovation well, but don't be surprised if the review, some of the reviewers don't get it, because that happens a lot. But the one thing to, to realize here is inspiration, a great idea, is not innovation in NIH, in the world of NIH. Had Watson and Crick come to the NIH to get support for coming up with their model for DNA, they probably wouldn't have gotten a grant. They didn't ask because NIH wasn't the place that it is back then, um, and they were not U.S. Uh, scientists. They didn't ask, but if they did, we prob they probably would have said no. But once that was established and well known, NIH was eager to support the development of further elaborating upon that innovation and that inspiration. Okay. The, se the next part of the research strategy is your approach section. This is where the bulk of the writing happens. Uh, I don't, it's not necessarily the, one second, it's not necessarily the best way to go, but it is the way it goes. Yes? Before we move on to the approach part, the, uh, the significance, do you usually say we should put some preliminary data there, or could it be um, just the review of literature? It depends on how your argument is going. Often there is some preliminary data there. Most of the time, most of the time it works better in the approach section just because it's otherwise telling the story, it's too choppy. It's too chopped up. Depends on how the flow is. One of the guidances that you should be thinking about is if you're a reviewer, put the reviewer's mindset on, is does it flow logically? If the reviewer is going to have a question, is that question going to be answered in the next sentence? And if that's the way it's going, that's what you should stick with. And so it's really a case-by-case -case thing. What's already been done, you, so, the, so it's pretty clear here that you want to tell uh, the reviewers about the preliminary data that you have already developed. But there are a couple of other things that are happening when you describe your preliminary data. And the first is, it shows that you know how to present your data. You know, you have mastered the techniques that are going to be required in this grant. You know how to use them. And you know how to present your work in figures and, and, and tables. You know how the best way to present the data is. And it shows that you can work well with others because you're going to have other members of the team. Important here is that reviewers are not going to look anything up. They might, and you're going to have citations in there. They might go look them up. And if you don't have them right, God help you, because they will ding you for that. But chances are they won't, and they're not expected to. So they're going to get annoyed if you make them go to a paper somewhere to decide whether this is true or not. So should, what is critical for understanding the grant should all be there. So make sure your preliminary data is rigorous, relevant, and thorough, and concise. Finally, you want to then tell them in the method section what exactly are you going to do. But this is the recipe for what you're going to do. So this should be not that big a deal, straightforward. You know, these are the techniques I'm going to do. If they're standard techniques, don't explain them. Only take the space to explain things that are going to be hard and difficult to illustrate. Okay? One thing to think about in this is, again, how do you show people that you are outstanding, that you are the best? Michael Phelps did not win eight gold medals because he was different from the rest of the people. They all wear the same bathing suits. They all take the same number of strokes under the water. But he got eight gold medals because he extracted every ounce of perfection out of the limited formula by which this was done. Is that clear to everybody? You know, you need to understand, for example, not repeating the same words over and over again, but the same concepts over and over again. You know, don't do things that will annoy the reviewers. Do things that make them say, gosh, this person is brilliant. So, avoiding it, and oh my gosh, my favorite pet peeve, 
please, please, I beg you, limit the jargon. If you are typing an abbreviation because you're too lazy to type it, that is a bad reason. It, 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 even if it's an abbreviation that is extremely well known in this particular field, it's a narrow field. So chances are most of the reviewers who look at your grant are going to have to learn a new language in order to read it because they're going to have to learn your jargon. But the next grant they pick up, they're going to have to throw away what they just learned and learn a different new jargon. That is really exhausting, and you want to save them that if you can. So only use jargon if you absolutely must. If you are going to exceed some sort of space limitation, or if it's going to look very odd to the to the people who are knowledgeable in your field, but you know you really should limit this as much as you possibly can. All right, briefly about human and animal subjects. Um, it doesn't apply to every grant, so I don't want to spend a ton of time on this. But I do want to point out to you that when it comes to human and human subjects. If you do not choose the right application for your grant, you may not get, you may not be able to send it to the NIH, or it may not get reviewed because it hasn't been put into the right application. So we'll show you that in a minute. And the other thing is that if you do not describe completely enough the the the, the procedures that you're going to use, the reviewers will say you have given them inadequate information to make a judgment, and you will get penalized for that. Um, I'm only going to talk about human subjects here, but some of the principles can also apply to animal subjects. And the point here about human subjects research is make sure you understand whether you're doing it or not. There are very, very specific interpretations for whether you are doing human subjects research. And it doesn't mean that if you are not sticking a needle in somebody's arm, it's not human subjects research. If you are using human cells, period, you need to ask these questions. Even if all you're doing is getting a bone marrow from somebody, okay? Depending on how that bone marrow is obtained, you might fall under the guidance of human subjects research. You need to ask these questions and find out. And if you need help, there's lots of help on the NIH websites. And you can also talk to people at the NIH that will help you with this. They are absolutely dead serious about this. And this can kill your grant, even if everything else about it is perfect. So one thing that's important is, in addition to whether or not you're using human subjects, are you doing a clinical trial? And that does not mean as defined by the FDA. This means as defined by NIH criteria. And heaven knows, they are a whole lot, it is a whole lot broader in, this, in that universe than in the FDA universe, OK? Again, I don't want to go into great number amount of detail on this because we don't have time. But I did want to let you know that you need to go to these websites and, and proceed down these checklists and ask these questions. Because, for example, on the extreme right hand side here, it has those three flavors of the application. So when you see now an application for the NIH, they're going to have a call saying, we want to de develop technology to look at um, you know, fibrosis in the liver. Okay. So they're going to issue three different calls. Clinical trials not allowed, clinical trials required, and you know studies with human cells that might not be clinical trials. OK, so if you don't pick the right one of these to fill out your application, you will not get reviewed. Is that clear to everybody? I know that I have glossed over this quickly, but that's, I just want to emphasize to you that you, these, are, these are questions you need to ask in very great detail about your grant. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time on this because you'll have these slides, but I just want to let you know that, that, that this information needs to be presented to the reviewers in this particular format. It's not just listing all your papers and your employment. You also have to talk about your specific contributions to science and the field and why that makes you the go-to person to be a part of this research at the level that you're participating in this study. So, you cannot do a one-size-fits-all biosketch. You've got to tailor it for each particular application that you're involved in. OK? Clear? All right, good. So in resources and facilities, what's really important for junior faculty is there's a lot you can pack into this that can really do you 
uh, a lot of ser good service here and doesn't violate any of the rules. So for example, if you're an early stage investigator, uh, you should emphasize and describe what things your institution does to support you. Do they give you, you know, extra mentoring? Do they give you uh, extra uh, uh, opportunity to take classes in, uh, in the technology transfer or whatever? You know, any of these things that um, are available to you, you should describe and hype in your grant application. Because there's not really a page limit to this part of the, uh, of the grant application. Now, if you make it 10 pages, you're going to annoy the reviewers. But, you know, if you make it two pages, that's not too much. And you might have some really good information on there that could really be useful to you. Um, most of you come from institutions where you're going to have budget help to figure this part out. But I just wanted to put this up here for two reasons. First, if you are somehow involved, for example, in an SBIR or some other situation where you don't have all that institutional support, the NIH has a lot of cheat sheets out there to show you how that you can build the budget and what works and what doesn't and how they like to see it. The other thing is, is that if your Office of Sponsored Research has a question about whether something in the budget makes sense or is allowed or not, you can find out the answers here. A general rule of thumb is, if there is some piece of information on an NIH website, the NIH is going to have to live with it. If you go in there and say, but I found it here, and you show them that they had it on a policy page somewhere, um, even if they've decided they don't like that particular explanation anymore, they're going to have to live up to it because it's a public document that's available, and they have to live by what they say in public. So. These, these resources are really, can be very useful. That said, you really do have to know that there are some places where there are regulations and they cannot, they cannot go outside of that universe. There are some places where there are guidelines and they're squishy and they can be changed and massaged and worked with. You need to figure out the difference and often that's the kind of thing you can do in a conversation with a program director. And then you have to uh, um, write your application accordingly. And so, for example, one of the places that's a guideline that's, uh, that's, that's exceeded all the time is budgets. If you read the, grant, the application, there are some which say, absolutely, never, never, never are we going to exceed this amount of money. And there are some that say, we expect the budgets to come in in this way. Okay, well, you know read between the lines and have a conversation with the program director. They're always going to try to make you come in under the guidelines and as cheaply as possible, but you know, you can with good justifications get more if need be. So in the end, when you have all of this assembled and put together, the closer you can get to this concept where you can distill down complex ideas to simple, interpretable terms, the better, you, the more help you are going to do for yourself. Because if you can explain things in simpler terms, then words like elegant apply to you, and those are always good things. Okay. On the other hand, make sure that you don't have it so simple that um, it looks like you don't know what you're talking about, that you're naive, because you will be penalized for that as well. So I wanted to give you uh, another sort of gestalt thing here. There's a woman in North Carolina named Morgan Giddings, and she is, has been doing uh, grant writing research for people and helping people write their grants for a couple of decades now. And she has a very interesting way of describing this, and I think it's absolutely true, which is that, you know, uh, when you write the grant, you are going to be writing it using your cerebral cortex. But you have to realize that when reviewers review your grant, they're going to be using their limbic brain. So they're going to look at things and they're going to want to understand how it makes them feel. Do they feel good about your grant? And so I would sort of work through and look at this slide at your leisure and, and realize the truth of this that if you sell this thing correctly, they're going to feel that you're the right person to do the job and this is the right 
the right grant, and they're going to give it a good score. But often what happens is when they give you some, a comment on your summary statement and there's a bunch of negative comments, they're, they're telling you how they feel, and they're just coming up with specifics to give you um, reasons for that. And often those reasons can look pretty trivial, and it's, it's not so much the reasons, it's the number of them. And what it, in the end, what, it, what matters is nobody wants to tell you you have an ugly baby. So they're going to try and make this more, quote unquote, scientific, but you have to be able to sort of read through the lines and understand, you know, they really didn't like this, and why did they not like it? Often you can figure that part out. Sometimes it takes familiarity with summary statements to peel the onion in just that way, but it's a very powerful tool if you know how to use it. Questions about this? Her website is up there if you want to go look at it. She's pretty expensive, but you can buy some of her stuff for it's compartmentalized into things. I've not done that, but I have looked a lot at her website, and I think she has a lot to offer. Um, I've never worked with her though. So, anyway, a couple of um, practical housekeeping things. Um, you, there are some certain circumstances in which you need to talk to the NIH before you send in a grant application. If you have over five hundred thousand dollars in direct costs, you have to talk to them. You have to get permission from the target institute to accept a grant, or the NIH will reject. It. And this is for planning purposes. You know, they just want to make sure. They know if they have a lot of big grants coming in the door during a particular cycle, so they can plan the budget for it accordingly. Um, also for conference grants. I'm not exactly sure why that is, but that's been the rule forever. But it's always recommended that you talk to a program director if you can, especially when you're talking about those, those pesky R21s and trying to figure out R03s and answer questions like, what that this gentleman was asking about, how do I get them through study section? What are they looking for? So in the end, you do have to pitch this towards the peer reviewers so that they, they will feel good about your grant. And how, here are some pointers here about how to do this. I'm going to cherry pick from this because some of this we've said before. Um, so I'm going to zero in on um, the bottom part, which is to follow the good, good grantsmanship. Again, following the instructions, limiting your acronyms, repeat and reinforce concepts, not words. If the exact same sentence appears in your grant three times, that is not good for you. If the exact same ideas appear in your grant with slightly different phraseology and organization, that is very good for you because you're reinforcing the concepts not the exact words. You only have 12 pages to tell the research strategy. If you're repeating yourself too much, people are going to think you don't have enough to say. Um, again, figures are great. They are so useful. And they make really good eye candy to break up, you know, just page and page and pages of text. But they have to be accurate, and they have to be useful and relevant. And for God's sakes, don't make your figures so small that they can't be read. Because the reviewers, that is one of the favorite things they put in a, 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 a summary statement. It's a nail in the coffin thing, but it, it, it's one of the first nails that gets hammered in there. OK, so, uh, so we're going to move on to um, a few things now about the review. But before that, let me just say, again, NIH has wonderful, wonderful websites. There's so much information on them. But it'll take you hours and hours to pour through them. So hopefully, um, a talk like this will help you zero in on some of the basics, and you can get some more details on these. But for example, this basic grants page, the bar at the top, if you click on some of these things, it can be very useful because you get some of the basics. You also get the due dates, and they're, they're all over the place nowadays. So it's a good idea to know when your particular mechanism, when it's due to, be, to go to the NIH. You also will, can sign up to get information about new funding initiatives and, sorry, I wanted to, and any policy updates and changes, like all those changes to the human subjects um, um, pages. So I encourage you to, to bookmark this when you find it and 
use it often. Um, when you send your grant, um, you can ask for some things. You can ask for, you can use this thing called the um, assignment re request form. And it's a checklist and you can ask for a study section. And there's a point in there where you can say why you want a particular study section. And it's always a good idea to describe the technology in your grant in a very succinct way, highlighting the things that are the most difficult to understand because that's going to highlight the reviewer expertise that's needed. Um, you can ask for the institute you think is most likely to be interested. And you can also ask for reviewers who should not see your grant application because they have conflicts. You know, this person is suing me, you know, they were on my PhD review committee and I got the impression they hated me or whatever. <laughs> and you also have the opportunity of sending in a cover letter in which you can explain some of these things that are listed down there. Uh, there is another part of the NIH that will explain the peer review process to you and it's all right there. And so one of the things I have to say is I, I alluded to before to the fact that there are over 200 standing review committees or study sections and your grant's going to get assigned to one of them somewhere. But you, ha you have some influence over how that happens. And so one of the things you can do is uh, you can look at um, how to identify the best study section. So if you go to the Center for Scientific Review, which is the locus of where the review is organized and happens at the NIH, you can go to that little part that says study sections. And when you're at that page, you can look at the innovative integrated review groups, which are all listed here. And you can choose one that looks like it might be the most logical place for your grant to, to, to live. In this example, we're going to go to bs and uh, bioengineering sciences and technologies and when we're there we land on a home page which is going to tell us down the bottom um, of it what review groups are represented within that home page and then I clicked on one which in this case is biomaterials and biointerfaces now I'm at the place where it describes the review committee itself and the first thing that you see is that you get a description of what that group does. What do they actually look at? Broadly and then by bullets. Well, what if it turns out that it doesn't quite match what you think your technology is about? There's this wonderful, useful thing at the bottom which tells you what the interests of the nearest neighbor study sections are. So what are the ones that are closest to the one that's described above? And if you go through this process where you look at a study section and how it's described, and then how its neighbors are described, pretty quickly you can zero in on the one or two or three study sections you might recommend. And finally, you can go and look up the roster of who's on that review committee for the last three rounds of review and get a sense of whether these are people that look like your peers or not. Or you can let the NIH do the work. And you can go to the assisted referral tool, which is at that website down there, and you can type in, what, as I did, a few key words, or you can paste an abstract in there, or whatever you want. And it's going to do some, some searching through just the process we went through and come up with some recommendations. And I can tell you that I agreed with this when I did this. So it's pretty useful as a first pass. Once your grant gets reviewed, and I'm not going to go into detail on how that happens because we don't have time, you will get an impact score. And that impact score will then also, remember those five review criteria? Each of the reviewers will also put a subscore associated with that five, those five review criteria. And ultimately, all together, they will come up with an impact score. But what's important for you to realize is, I, I can't tell you the number of PIs who've talked to me and said, I looked at all the three reviewers and I averaged out all the five sub-criteria categories and there's no way I can come up with an impact score that's any kind of arithmetic, geometric, or any other kind of average. It's because it doesn't matter. Because there is no averaging of this. The reviewers are told to weight these criteria differently depending on the grant they're reading. So they will uh, come up with their own ideas about how important. They might give you a score of one on um, the uh, significance and an eight on the approach. Guess what? 
your score is going to be closer to six than, than two on that particular grant because they tend to weight the approach more heavily. And as a matter of fact, the approach and the significance are the two most important criteria in terms of how closely they correlate with the impact score. And the impact score is the score that the institutes will use to make a decision about your grant. Okay. They also will look at comments on acceptability of human or animal subjects, vertebrate animals, um, whether you have this is a resubmission and you've addressed the prior critiques the last study section I had, and if you've made sufficient progress, okay? Those all are allowed to go into the score. The human and animal subjects issues go into the score to the extent that you can do the job and you have described appropriately what you're going to do with those particular tools. Not necessarily whether you've got the animal study protocol or not approved. The, the fine points of the administrative details, but just whether it makes sense and whether you've got the tools to do it. But then we also ask them to make comments about the administrative issues, which are not things that are taken into in their scoring. After study section is done, the grants, we described earlier the fact that they get turfed out to study section based on the technology or the science that's proposed. And then after the review, they all come back and get redistributed back to the home institutes. And they go to review and council, uh, which is where the, the council, the advisory council sort of looks over all of this and says, yeah, this looks good. There's nothing out here that looks out of the ordinary or strange. And this is the place where appeals are heard if one is requested or something that's out of the ordinary or special considerations happen. But in the end, all of this comes back to the, to the director who sets the criteria for what they want to see in the, in the grant applications and sets the pay lines and sets the determinants on um, how they're going to judge um, what the institute does and which grants it's going to fund. So the take home here is that the competition in the study section is about all the other NIH grants in that scientific area. So when you come out of the study section, you're ranked according to um, according to who's the best and who's the worst, based on that group's opinion of its particular part of science. But then when you go back to, to advisory council, we're now at the place where other considerations like what's hot and what's necessary to fulfill the mission of that IC, and do we tweak this uh, ranking in any way to achieve that. Is that clear to everyone, that there's really in the end, it's the program people that make the ultimate decision, but a lot of different things go into that, to that um, conversation. Chances are when you submit an application to the NIH, you're not going to get funded the first time. And it's just a numbers game because it's 1 in 15, 1 in 20 now at some institutes, if you're lucky, get funded. So that means even Nobel laureates get told no sometimes. So what happens? You're going to get a summary statement that tells you what the opinion of the committee was. How do you respond to it? A couple of ways. First is, don't do anything when you first read it because it's going to make you angry. So take a little while to calm down. You also have to learn how to read between the lines. Again, no one wants to tell you your baby is ugly. So the true opinion about what the, what the review committee thought is somewhere between the words and the score. Okay, Somewhere in that mix. And, and you can often use a program director to help you understand it. Realize that this is sometimes a dialogue with the peer review committee. You know, they're trying to tell you what they think are the issues. You have the opportunity to respond to that. And so one of the potential responders is, you're full of hot air. You're wrong. I'm right. I know this stuff. You're, what you're telling me to do is not right in order to pursue this science. You can say that to them, but you have to be respectful and you have to give them a good justification for why you're not going to do what they suggested you suggested to you. From a practical point of view, there is a way to respond and you're going to get a, a one page in your revised grant application to explain to them how you're going to respond. And so there's a way to do this and a way to organize it and essentially you have to nest uh, related comments and respond to them as a group. And if there are changes that they suggest that you go, oh, why didn't I think of that? That was, that was so stupid that I did that. 
do that right away and just fix it. And again, if you're going to resist, tell them why. Absolutely be polite. Do not annoy them because they're in charge unless and until you get a good score and you get the grant. So, in general, you should also be, understand that there are a lot of resources in the NIH you should be able to exploit. Um, build relationships with your program directors. You can also ask questions of the uh, SROs that run the review meetings as needed. And there's a lot of opportunity to learn a lot of things from the grant specialist who you don't interact with very much unless and until you get a grant. But they know an awful lot about what's allowable and non-allowable on cert if you have certain very strange things on your grant application that might involve, for example, foreign collaborators or expenses that are unusual that you want to make sure are allowed within the grant. So those three people can be extremely useful resources for you um, in pursuing questions about your grant application. Um, emphasis here on the program director. They are the people that are going to hold your hand from the very beginning when you have a scathingly brilliant idea. They are not involved in the review because they have to, they, they are allowed to interact with you so much before you send the grant application in. Once you send it in, they could be conflicted. So they step away and they, they watch what happens, but they can't participate in it. The grants, the scientific review officer will rarely interact with you because they have to maintain their, um, their absence of bias so they can give you a proper review. And we talked a little bit about the grant specialist. So approaching NIH is always a good idea, but before you have a conversation with the program director, you should go in there armed with these, pe with these items. Rough out the arc of your project, and if you can, come up with a specific aims page. That's always the best place to start the conversation. Send an email with a specific aims page attached. That's the place to start the conversation. When you are right out the arc of this project, make sure it fits the NIH mission, okay? And you can use, we're going to get into a little bit, Reporter, this nice database of funded projects to help you make that decision. Um, draft your specific aims page. Now that you have all that ammunition, then you can go talk to a program director because then you will really have the benefit of a very, very in-depth level conversation, not just a superficial thing, and then they don't want to talk to you very much after that because you become a pest. So I talked a little bit about reporter. I want to fly through this quickly because we're really running out of time. I always do. Um, but the point is, it is an NIH database that has the abstracts of everything they've ever funded. And it's Boolean searchable, so it's a really, really useful tool. And you can search by all of these things and more, whatever creativity strikes your boat, you can come up with ways to do this. And so, for example, let's say you're looking for a collaborator. If you search for a combination of your um, topic area, some keywords, plus you put in by state, you can find out who else has NIH grants in this application area, get the abstracts and see if this might be somebody you might want to work with, etc. Um, you can do this searching on your own, or if you utilize this matchmaker function, you can get the NIH to do it for you. If you go to matchmaker, you can again type in some specific terms or an abstract or whatever you want. And when you look for similar projects, you're going to get a really nice output. Down below here, you can see one listing of a grant. Because this is a screenshot, you don't see the 50 that are below that. Okay. But then you are also going to get a printout of telling you which of the institutes and centers have grants in that space. You can see the distribution there. So those are going to be places where you might find a happy home. You're going to see the activity code, which tells you that there are a lot of R01s in this particular search. Not very many R03s or R21s. So that's telling you this is a very mature field okay, that the NIH is very comfortable with. And you're going to see the study sections. These are the places where not only did these grants get reviewed, but grants that got funded got reviewed. So this is all very useful stuff that can be, can be you can data mine this for some really good information. 
And there is a website, a blog, that is sponsored by NIGMS, General Medical Sciences, where they discuss a lot of the ways you can use Reporter to your benefit in this and other ways. So it's also a good idea to think about what are the hot topics at NIH and how do you figure out, because remember I said at the way, way back at the beginning, something about the common fund and something about the fact that yes, NIH has these little slivers of institutes and they all have very particular missions, but there are often a lot of things that are trans NIH and their importance and also things that come up that emerge that are places where some of the NIH budget gets put aside in addition to what those institutes are doing. And this is often the place where some really cool and, and robust opportunities for getting grant support can live. So how do you find out what's going to be a hot topic? Well, one of the best ways to do this is to realize that every year the NIH director has to go before Congress and testify as to what we've done with your money last year and why we want more money next year and what are we going to do with it. And he will actually <coughs> present to them what he thinks are the most important priorities, or she, for the NIH in the upcoming year. Well, I created this slide every year I update it, based on the last time the NIH director went to Congress. And these were the things he said were important to him. And, you know, bottom line is, most of the time, those things turn into funding initiatives in the near future. So it's a great place to figure out what's going to come up next. Often what happens is they translate into things through the Common Fund, which are these trans-NIH initiatives. Uh, without going into any detail on them, you can see that some of them are topics that look pretty broad. The ones that are starred with red asterisks are ones that are relatively newer programs where I think that the, the are, there is ongoing activity to watch for, that there may be new initiatives. Some of them are more mature and they're starting to phase out. But the other thing about the Common Fund is there was one box on that slide where it talked about high risk, high reward projects. This is an ongoing part of the Common Fund which focuses on um, things that are outside of the norm. So for, especially for young and junior investigators, the new innovator DP2 mechanism or the Pioneer Award are really robust and worthwhile efforts for you to check out. There's one deadline every year, it's usually in September, so we've just passed it. But um, these are places where you can really get a very high profile award for high risk stuff that is an opportunity that would not come up in other parts of the NIH. The applications are quite different from a normal NIH application. The review process is different. There's a lot about this that's different. I won't get into the specifics, but just be aware that this is out there and is a very attractive place for you to look for an investment and I guarantee your institutions love these because they're considered very high profile and uh, very elite. Any questions about the Common Fund? It's a really nice website to, to snoop around in. Also a, re a resource that you should be plugged into, the NIH Guide. Um, what's nice about the NIH Guide is it lists all the current funding initiatives that are active and ongoing. And so you can find them out by just searching or you can, whoops, actually, sorry, sign up uh, to get weekly emails to tell you what the latest ones that came out that week are. So that's a very useful website. There, the, um, Mike Lauer is the director of the Office of Extramural Research, and he has a, a blog every, every week. He tells you latest and greatest information from NIH, and you can send him comments, and the NIH does listen. And they often will change policy or give you further elaboration of details or do deep dives into the data at NIH to reveal things about the process based on the comments that come in from constituents. So, I'm almost at the end here. Just wanted to review for you a few of the strategies for, for being successful at the NIH. And first, as we've said, and as you can see from the last two hours, this is not a trivial thing. This is hard. And it's going to take you, especially if you're not very well versed at it, if you're starting from just an idea and collecting some, some colleagues who want to work on you, work with you on this, 
could take you up to six months to put something like this together in a credible fashion. And realize that, you know, the odds are not great. Somebody gets the grants, and it might as well be you, but you might have to keep at it. Um, exploit the program officials. They are your best resource. You can find them at the web page for all of the institutes have, a web, have websites. And if you go to the tabs at the top, they often have things like funding or initiatives or research. And if you poke around in those websites, you're going to eventually get to program directors and their emails. And you can send them emails with those specific AIMS pages and get the help that you need. We talked a little bit about the electronic tools that are available. You should really make use of those because <coughs> The more informed you are when you go to talk to the NIH, the more, um, the more you're going to benefit from those people-to-people -people contacts. Target your submissions to the, um, to the uh, open parent announcements, but be aware that there are going to be very specific calls for investment. Um, and if they match your target area, pursue them with all gusto, because there's usually protected review space for them. And so things that might not get funded under the parent announcements would find a happy home under some of those specific calls. Do your homework. Make sure you understand which study section might be the best for you, which institute, and people that shouldn't see your grant. Don't try and appeal. It's stupid. There are a lot of reasons why it doesn't work for you. I don't want to go into the specifics, but the bottom line is you can submit a uh, an NIH proposal, the same idea, as many times as you want. So why would you waste time annoying people um, by trying to appeal the decision just because you're angry? Don't get angry, get even. Get funded. Um, participate in workshops and symposia. OK, peer review is conducted by peers, right? So if you go to a scientific meeting and somebody meets you and they think you're pretty cool, when they're reviewing your grant application, if they're waffling between a two or a three in your score, chances are if they know you and they like you because they met you already, they're going to err on the side of giving you the better score. But that's not going to happen if you're not out there selling yourself. And uh, it's always a good idea to serve on study sections. And so the best way to get started on that is to send an email to the scientific review officer of the study section you want to serve on because there are multiple different ways to get in the door and so they will tell you what they prefer. One tip on this, do not request service on the study section that you think is your go-to study section. If you serve on that study section, they like you and they put you on it, if they put you on for like a three-year term, your grants have to go somewhere else to get reviewed. So if that's the only one that you like, for heaven's sakes, try to serve on one that's closely related so you know the drill, but you're not shooting yourself in the foot by, by having your grants sent to some place where the people are not going to understand them. That's all I have to say, except to remind you, and for those of you who may have come in late, um, this session was supposed to be done by, my, by myself and my colleague, Dr. Sastre. He is unfortunately down with pneumonia, so you got just me. But between the two of us, we have a very broad coverage of just about all things bioengineering. And so we are happy to help you with your grant applications if you need that help. Reach out to us. We have different models, but essentially we, can, we try to be as economical as possible in working with you, starting with looking at your aims and moving on from there if necessary. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions for you. And please give me feedback on whether you found this useful or not and what you think got left out of the discussion especially. So what can I tell you? What questions can I answer now? Yes? Very happy presentation. Thank uh, you. But the uh, so question I have, let's say you are somewhat lucky. You get a borderline score, maybe a couple of points below an A line, right? And your uh, program officer asks you to say, hey, can you respond to the summary statement, right? So do you do you respond to that as if you write your introduction for like a resubmission, or is there other strategies that you think that like should I agree with every everything they said, or should I do something else? So this is a little bit weird because um, 
sometimes you get program directors that will do that, and sometimes you don't, because it's very it's a very gray area for NIH when 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 program directors have a conversation with you about going beyond what's written in the summer statements. Some institute directors encourage that because they want to fend the best science and they don't care how they find out. Some institute directors absolutely forbid that because they feel like it's an unfair advantage. So you got to sort of take your cues. So the first thing I would suggest is do not approach the program director and offer to do that because you don't know which of those situations you're in and you don't want to so-called screw the pooch by doing something that they don't like. But if they call you, then I would have a conversation with them about what are they looking for when you say respond to. Do you mean you want more explanation for some things that sometimes what happens is reviewers are not consistent because they review these things in isolation, right? And so they might have um, slight disagreement on their, their, their comments. So they want you to resolve that, that, uh, that disagreement among the two reviewers. Or they might totally agree with something, and that would be something that would be a big deal. So they, they, would, they would expect you to maybe change that thing. I think the optimal way of responding, if you're asked to respond, is you don't want to suggest too much that you want to change. Because if you're suggesting a change, that should be a resubmission. But what you want to do is you want to elaborate or further explain or provide more detail. So here's an example. I was um, uh, in the situation where we had exactly that happening. And we had a, the PI's description of the animal studies was pretty vague. And uh, it was a little bit surprising because it was a very experienced PI. And so one reviewer was, was kind of troubled by the vagueness in this animal study. So I was asked to go and get some more information from the PI. So the rationale that they had for why the animal study was vaguely written, and in this case it was, there weren't a lot of descriptions about the numbers that would be in each group, et cetera, et cetera. They said, well, when we wrote the application, the preliminary data was still, we, we had a little bit, but we didn't have the six week or eight week time points or whatever it was. And so what we didn't know was on the preliminary data, what, what was what we were shooting for, a 20% difference, a 40% difference, or whatever, based on the preliminary data. So we couldn't do the power analysis, so we couldn't put the numbers in for the number of animals that would be in that study. But that was when we submitted the grant application, and now it's six months later, so now we have all that information, so we know. And so what I got from him was an elaboration of this is what the animal study is meant to look like based on the power analysis, based on what we got as preliminary data. That was an elaboration, not a change. Okay, so that <coughs> flew and we funded the work. But in a different situation, if you have to come back and say, oh, I understand what they said, and so I would do this differently, that differently, that differently, that's probably not going to work. I mean, it might be good for resubmission, but it may not work for making a funding decision. Does that, does that make that, sense? That, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. But I would be guided by the program director to the extent that you can be. And, every, and again, these people are all human, so they're going to have different levels of being able to give you more information. Anybody else? There are a zillion questions about so many of these aspects, and we could have conversation from now until the cows come home about all of it. And I'm happy to sit and have more conversations with you about it if you want here, or you have my contact information, call me up, send me an email. Um, there, there, there are a lot of ways to slice this fruit and uh, partake. And I wish you all the best of luck, because it's not easy, but it's very rewarding. So we're done. <laughs>